Since his first book was published in 07, he has received numerous literary awards and was selected as MacArthur Fellow in 2012. So I'm proud to introduce to you Mr. Dinawa Mengetzer. Um, is, that, is that okay? I realize I'm tall. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I, I had not expected to receive anything, much less a proclamation. Um, it's the first and probably last proclamation I will, I will get, except for when my son proclaims that I don't know what I'm talking about, um, which is a daily occurrence, but this is something that I can use back at him. I can say, yeah, it's true, I don't, but <laughs> this at least tempers that argument. Um, it's also a great reminder of, of, of just what a wonderful thing libraries and are and how they embody the communities that we're so very fortunate at times to be a part of. Um, and why I've been a familiar, I can't say that I can claim to have been in Silver Spring for a long time, but it is a place that I've known intimately since I was quite young. Um, my uncle's been here for a long time. I've got a wonderful cousin back over there. That's her, um, who just moved back after graduating from Columbia. And um, it's very much this area in DC, this community has been um, and has literally become home since my family all live here now for, for quite a long time. And, um, and it's very nice to be back here and to be amongst all of you. I was um, speaking with somebody earlier downstairs and, and noting that it's been uh, 10 years since this book came out, which um, if you look at the book jacket in the back, you'll see a photo of me and it will confirm very much <laughs> those 10 years have passed. There's a more hair and probably a slightly fitter form on the back of that book than there is now. And I would, I would think that almost have, you know, 10 years of, of being able to talk about something, you feel very fortunate. And I would almost expect after that amount of time that it, the conversation would begin to feel a little bit rote or, or familiar, that you can only say so many things about a book or about the characters you've written about, but that's, um, that's never been the case every time. I talk about the novel, something different comes up, um, something different emerges from the experiences I have talking with readers. And I think that's a fact that says little of anything about the book and, and everything about the fact that the culture and the context in which we read is constantly changing. And so this evening we are here in a public library and it's a space that's open in theory to anyone who chooses to walk through its doors. And like just about every writer I know, I have a real fondness for libraries. They are the proverbial home away from home for the bookish child or the adult. I don't know a writer or reader who doesn't have some story of being lost among the shelves of books in a library, a story of walking home with a bag bursting full of novels. And in the past when reading or talking in a public library, that would be the image I'd want to settle on. I'd want to tell you about what it was like being young and finding refuge among novels, about finding my world opening up as I sat lost among texts that I'd never encountered before. And there's a pull to want to linger on this particular image of walking into a space like this empty-handed and leaving feeling as if I were armed with something. And it's not that that image doesn't matter anymore, and it's certainly not that the books themselves matter any less. But like I said, the culture and the context in which we read is different now. And this talk or this reading, whenever they happen, especially under the big reads, it's never really about a single book or a story or an author. And this is a time where I think we're forced to oblige, or we're obliged to focus on the seemingly small, and simple act of strangers filing into a room, regardless of faith, age, gender, background. Strangers who are weirdly willing to sit and listen and discuss or even nap fitfully in the back. <laughs> and it's an important act, one that I would say is as vital to a nation as walking into a booth and filling in a ballot box. And yet, because it happens so often, and with so little fanfare, that it's easy to miss the transformation that's suddenly taking place. A wall of books, a patch of grass, 
a building full of rooms. Every time we walk into these spaces together, we transform them. We gather, and when we do so, we make them into something far more important. We turn them into public spaces. And I say all that because this small, seemingly ordinary act is under attack right now. Because we are gathered here to discuss a novel whose central characters are immigrants, at a moment in our country's history, when our friends, neighbors, co-workers, whether we know them or not, live in fear and anxiety because they are immigrants. I say that because we are gathered here to supposedly discuss a novel whose central characters are immigrants. At a moment in our country's history when families arriving at our border seeking asylum are being, are being cruelly torn apart. I say this because I've been told that I'm an immigrant writer or that I write immigrant fiction, or that I'm an Ethiopian writer or an African writer, and that this is an immigrant novel with immigrant characters. And I always used to say that I don't believe in the immigrant writer or the immigrant novel because those are political categories, and those categories have nothing to do with literature. I remember when this book came out, one reviewer wrote that this novel was a perfect book for lovers of immigrant fiction. And I remember at the time joking with friends that who could this imaginary reader be and what would they possibly look like, the person who says, I love immigrant fiction. <laughs> and then I took a, spe a step back and thought it'd be more interesting to try to imagine the person who says, I hate immigrant fiction. <laughs> and back then, a little naively, the only image I could come up with was this sort of cartoonishly Grinch-like character. And that, of course, is no longer true. We don't need to imagine what that figure looks like anymore. They stare back at us in one form or another every single day, not only in words, but in action. A few years ago, I traveled to Eastern Congo to report on a war that at the time was entering its 10th year. The war began when the same militias that were responsible for the 1994 genocide in Rwanda crossed the border into Congo as a way of escaping persecution or pers <laughs> prosecution for the crimes they had committed. They had killed hundreds of thousands of Tutsis, many of whom bore features similar to mine, and then they got away. They set up camp in Congo just on the other side of the Rwandan border. Now, when I got there, I knew almost as soon as I crossed the border from Rwanda into Congo that I was looked at suspiciously. I was black. I was African in name and birth, but I spoke English like an American, and I carried its sacred blue passport. According to almost everyone I met in both Rwanda and in eastern Congo, I also looked like someone who in the not-too-distant past would have been marked for death. I had a wonderful translator, Caleb, who carried me or took me around everywhere. And he acted as my bodyguard slash fixer slash translator. And when I told him that I wanted to go to where the Rwandan rebels were hiding, this very large, burly man smiled and looked at me and shook his head and said, no. <laughs> and I said, why not? And he said, yeah, you know, because of the way you look. It just might cause problems. Back then, the UN soldiers were responsible for pretty much all the security in that part of the country. And tensions were high since Congo was celebrating its 50th anniversary. It made it even more likely that I would be mistaken for a troublemaker or a Rwandan spy. Before getting on a helicopter for a remote village where fights between the Congolese soldiers and former Rwandan rebels were still common, I was given a UN escort and lodging with soldiers on top of a hill which offered a stunning view over the jungle and the villages buried inside of it. After two days, though, I dropped the escort that the UN had given us and decided to follow rumors of an attack to another village about an hour away. That village and the soldiers that were assigned to protect it had been attacked the same night that I arrived there. Although, according to the UN, all was calm in the area. When we neared the village, we saw the burned out remains of the military post. And we found the soldiers who had been assigned to protect it 
huddled together in shorts and sandals, buried, hiding inside the only structure that wasn't burned to the ground. We got there and I spoke to the lieutenant who was in charge. Quickly, he described how the rebels attacked them that evening while they were sleeping with their wives and children next to them. The lieutenant told me that a few of his soldiers were shot, including a baby. He told me that their homes and all of their belongings were burned. And after he finished telling me all that, he asked me where I was from. And I looked at him and I told him I was from America. He shook his head and nodded and said, okay. And then he asked me again, no, where are you really from? I smiled and said, New York. <laughs> and he smiled and shook his head, oh, okay. And, and then before, before that, he asked, and I took a pause back and wanted to figure out what he was asking, and I said, oh, um, Washington, D.C. And then at this point, he stopped smiling. And he looked at me straight in the face, and he turned to Caleb, my translator, and said, no, 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 that's not what he wanted to know. He asked Caleb to tell me, tell him I want to know where did I come for, where did I come from before then? Tell him I want to know who is he really? Now, in retrospect, it seems a little comical that I had to travel so far it took so many years to understand what a dangerous question that is. Where are you from? Who are you really? There are many other variations on that question, of course, and you could almost examine the history of our country through the lens of those variations. Where are you from? Where are you really from? Where were you born? What's your origin? What's your real origin? What's your religion? What's your last name? Do you have a boyfriend, girlfriend? What town, city, village, country was your father born in, was your mother raised in? What church or mosque, temple, synagogue do you go to? To some degree, those are the exact same questions I was trying so hard to avoid when I began writing fiction. Perhaps the greatest difference between my immigrant parents and myself is they, they had to slowly and painfully learn to be suspicious of how they were treated, seen, and thought of in America. As a child, my father used to insist on our Ethiopianness. You are Ethiopian, he would say every single day in English, in our house, in the suburbs of Chicago just before I ran out the door to spend the afternoon eating hot dogs and playing basketball with my friends. He'd also sometimes tease my mother and say, you are a refugee. To which my mother would stomp her feet and say, no, I'm not a refugee, I'm Ethiopian. My mother was smart, of course. She knew how complicated these words were labels and stereotypes and cliches that parade themselves as objective political realities. The truth, of course, is that we were refugees. My father had left Ethiopia shortly before I was born and not too long after his brother was arrested and died in prison. He went to Italy and then America as a refugee. And once in America, he did what countless of other desperate immigrants separated from their family have done before. He wrote letters. He wrote to his senator and congressman. He had others write letters on his behalf. And in those letters, a particular narrative was born. We weren't just refugees anymore. We were political exiles. We were political exiles fleeing a ruthless communist government during the height of the Cold War. No, we were Christian political exiles fleeing a Soviet-backed communist government during the height of the Cold War. I never asked my father, but I'm certain he felt blessed to have made it to America, to have found his letters for support returned. When we arrived at the airport in Peoria, Illinois, shortly before Christmas in 1980, there was a story in the local newspaper with a banner that said, Christmas comes early for local family.
I used to think my father's daily reminders, remember you are Ethiopian, were simple declarations of pride, a natural desire to try however desperately, however feebly, to ensure that his rapidly Americanized children didn't become completely foreign to him. By and large, I'm sure that was the dominant intent, but I would argue that there was a second desire buried in those words, one not easily expressed even today. Remember, you are Ethiopian. It's another way of saying remember, you are not American. And perhaps more essential and to the point, remember, you have to be careful. I didn't decide I wanted to be Ethiopian, though, until I first heard someone call me a nigger. I could remember then all the times my, I heard my friend's parents complain about the niggers in the neighborhood, on the street, in the car next to them, only to remind me, and perhaps themselves, in the very next breath, that they weren't racist. My father, who only in moments of desperation drove beyond the speed limit, once got four tickets and a single afternoon driving in Ohio. It wasn't until the fourth ticket, though, that he begun to th began to think that maybe all those tickets had something to do with the color of his skin and the car he was leasing. I'm sure it wasn't the first time he had to confront the fact that regardless of how he thought of himself, the country he was in, the country that for 20 years now was home, sometimes held him in an entirely different light. <clears throat> but what I saw was that unlike me, he was able to shed that second gaze. He could uncoil its infects from his mind and body. And briefly, I tried to do the same. There was a period where I tried to slip out of my American skin. I decided that if America could reject me, then I could do the same to it. For years, I refused to take citizenship. I told myself I was purely and solely Ethiopian. I joined my mother, who years earlier had refused being labeled a refugee. There was a problem, though. I lived only in America. I was a product of its culture, its schools, and it was impossible to reject that without rejecting a part of myself as well. The very first novel I tried writing, I wrote it in the most American landscape I could think of, the Midwest. I gave it what I thought all great stories needed, a somewhat meaningless, pretentious title, and then a great big flood, and a pair of brooding young men desperate to escape the smallness of their world. For 400 pages, my characters, and I use that word in the loosest possible sense, <laughs> walked around their small town, digging in boxes, looking at each other longingly from across the room in diners, thinking to themselves great, big, important thoughts, such as, whatever I do, that's it. <laughs> All the characters in the novel had familiar names. Most of them lifted straight from the Bible. Isaac, Sarah, Bill. Bob. They lived in a nameless town, in an unnamed state at an unspecified period in history, and they weren't white or black or brown. They had eyes and hair that weren't blue or brown or black or green. And I wrote that novel for four years, and my friends and I called it my flood novel, because the flood was the only thing that happened in 400 pages. <laughs> The other 390 pages were spent looking at the sky, wondering when it was going to rain. <laughs> and when the book was done, I sent it to every agent and editor I could think of in New York. And after years of rejections, I finally began to accept what I knew was always true. There was something flawed, empty, and dead about that book. When that soldier in Congo asked me to tell him who I really was, he was simply stating a fact that I only recently and through writing have come to accept. Like so many of us these days, and it's like so many of us now more than ever, I don't stand benignly in any crowd. 
I don't stand, sleep, eat here without being acutely aware of the oddity of my name, the differences in our history, the culture, or the color of my skin. After I left those soldiers in Congo and their burned out garrison, we drove a couple hundred yards away along the same dirt road. And there was the village that those soldiers were supposed to protect. I huddled in a house with a dozen of the village elders. And for the next hour, I listened to their stories of being pillaged and robbed, kidnapped and raped. Not just once, but three times that year. When I finally asked them why the soldiers who I'd just spoken to, the soldiers who were only a few hundred yards away and the government that stood behind them didn't do more to protect them, their answer was swift, definitive. The soldiers, they said, were from a different part of the country, as were most of the leaders in the government. Technically, though, they were all part of the same country, by extension, the same community. But those things no longer existed anymore except in name. We can stand in the same room with one another. We can live in the same town, the same country. We can attend the same schools. But all too often, we do so as strangers. One of the more radical and dangerous ideas about why we read books and then sometimes do this ridiculous thing where we gather to discuss them is because we believe that we want to see further and deeper than the surface of our skins, our nationalities, our status. Not only because we need to, but because the very world that we want to live in, the one that's not in front of us yet, demands that we do so. The right to gather to transform this library into a public library isn't merely granted, it's earned. A long time ago, I was at a bar in Munich, sitting next to a group of young boys who were 20, 22 years old. And they were all from Bosnia. Their families had left during that war and had come to Germany. After drinking for a while with them, one of those boys told me, you know, I've been in this country for 10 years now, he said. I even went to the German army right after high school. But I'll tell you something. They'll never let me be German. But now America. If I could get to America, I could become American just like that. And the beautiful things that heaven bears, the narrator Sefis Stefanos comes to America, opens up a grocery store, and spends his days thinking about and reliving the past. He has only minor ambitions. It poses a problem for many readers who rightfully ask, why isn't he fulfilling his end of the social contract? A question that's also been phrased as, what kind of immigrant is this man? Or, what are you trying to say about the American dream? My answer for a long time has been pretty straightforward. It's that I'm not saying anything about the American dream, except that the American dream isn't a house or a car. It's not the picket fence or the TV that we think we can buy. It isn't anything that can be purchased. It is, if anything, the dream of becoming. It's the dream of a boy in Munich who's convinced that if there's one place in the world that he can go to and become a part of, it's here. The immigrant narrative is a political term. And to defend it is to defend whatever idea of the American dream we have. To defend it vigorously in what we write, in what we read, in what we say. And so yes, this is an immigrant novel full of immigrant characters, written by an immigrant for readers who love immigrant fiction. Thank you.